Brooke, for those who, of you who don't know, and most of us do, is currently president and CEO of, of Cretton Minerals, is a private diamond exploration company. And he is also president of the consulting firm JVC Ventures. And Brooke has pretty much been around, been there, done that. So we look forward to your discussion on the Canadian diamond history. Okay, thank you, Tanya and John, for the invitation to speak. You put together quite a session. And today I'm going to summarize the Canadian diamond business, emphasizing exploration, my area of expertise, and the history. I, I expect that a lot of you in South Africa, especially some of the younger people, may not be extremely familiar with the story. It's, it's a great story. The Canadian diamond business really came out of nowhere 30 or so years ago. And it's, it's, it's a great example of what good exploration, strong support from investors, communities, and regulators can achieve. Okay. So before I start, just some acknowledgements. I've been in diamond exploration most of my career, and I'd like to acknowledge four of my employers, X-Men Corporation, Ashton Mining of Canada, Peregrine Diamonds, and Craton Minerals. I also want to acknowledge my family, who's given me great support, my wife Juanita, my son Jeffrey, and my parents. And also in this business, I really feel like I've had the pleasure to meet a lot of interesting and inspiring people, and some of them actually quite eccentric. And that's been a real pleasure, and some of those people are actually involved with this short course. So here's an outline of the presentation. First, I'm going to summarize North American diamond exploration and diamond districts, just emphasize how important teamwork is in creating something like the Canadian diamond business or any, any great discovery. I'm gonna provide case studies of four Canadian exploration programs and I'm gonna summarize the current status of the Canadian diamond business and speculate on its future. This map, shows the interpreted basement geology in North America. The pink interpreted Archean basement and the green early Proterozoic terrains that were accreted onto the Archean cratons. A lot of the Precambrian geology is covered by younger sediments. If you look at this map, the, it, it shows the status of known kimberlites in North America in 1990 as blue diamonds. You can see in 1990, there were a lot more known kimberlites in the United States than in Canada. And arguably before 1990, there was more exploration in the United States than in Canada. I estimate maybe over 200 million US was spent on diamond exploration in the USA between 1975 and 2010. And there were modest attempts at diamond mining in Colorado at Kelsey Lake, and in Arkansas at Prairie Creek. I spent the first 15 years of my career exploring for diamonds in the United States before moving to Canada in 1998. Just a little bit of geography. I'm gonna be talking about the Northwest Territories, the territory of Nunavut in the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. And this red line represents the Arctic Circle. Technically, everything north of that line is, quote, the Arctic. But most people in Canada consider a zone 100, 200 kilometers south of that line or more the Arctic as well. So diamonds were discovered on the Slave Craton in 1999, and that ignited a uh, a diamond exploration rust, the likes of which the world had never seen before and will probably never see again. And a lot of the activity that was ongoing in the United States kind of shifted to Canada. On this map, red diamonds represent all the kimberlites discovered in North America after 1990. Between 1991 and 2021, I estimate over 900 kimberlites were discovered in Canada and about 25 new districts. Over 3.9 billion Canadian was spent on exploration and it was really 
remarkable success. One thing to note is that since 1990, there's no documented kimberlite discoveries in the United States since 1990. The result of all that exploration, seven Canadian diamond mines, five on the Slave Craton, Jericho, Akati, Diavik, Snap Lake, and Gaucho Quay, and two on the Superior Craton, Victor and Renard. Four of those mines are still operating, and I'm going to summarize those towards the end of the talk. One of the things that's really important to realize that a lot of things have to come together to make a great discovery and also just create this new business that was created in Canada so suddenly. It really requires a lot of teamwork. Of course, great technical work and prognostication by the geologists that decide where to explore, how to explore, all the logistics associated with that. But equally, or even maybe more important, is support from investors. The Canadian, Canadian diamond business was really the, the support from investors for junior diamond explorers was really unprecedented, billions of dollars. And without that and support from communities and regulators, it really never would have happened. Another really important thing in the Canadian diamond business, and I think in discoveries everywhere, is the importance of partnerships and joint ventures. You know, people sharing the risk for their work. Uh, six of the seven Canadian diamond mines were the result of partnerships at either the discovery and or development stages. This just shows the statistics on the exploration spending in Canada since 1988, a few years before the great discovery, over 3.9 billion Canadian, that's 3 billion US. You can see on this graph here below that shows you know, expenditures on the y-axis, time on the x-axis at the peak was in 2006, over 300 million spent on exploration in the decade from 2001 to 2010 was really a peak over 2 billion spent. Really quite, quite a lot of, quite a lot of spending. Common thread through all these discoveries is indicator mineral sampling. I, as far as I know, all but three districts were discovered as a result of indicator mineral sampling. The indicator mineral sampling got you into an area and it allowed you to fly a pretty focused airborne survey, airborne geophysical survey, which led to the discoveries. Three districts, two in Alberta and one in Saskatchewan were discovered directly by geophysics. And you can see sampling methods really haven't changed that much. On the left, there's a lithograph from 1556 showing people wet screening samples and the field part of indicator mineral sampling probably hasn't changed much in the hundreds of years. The exploration in Canada was really remote or for the most part has been really remote and really costly. Virtually all the support is by aircraft and if you're lucky, an ice road going somewhere near your project and you know big planes to transport bulk samples, remote expensive exploration camps. And just as an example, this core rig in Nunavut in 2010, to move that rig from site to site, it has to be dismantled into 18 parts. Each part is then slung by a helicopter to the next site and people are on the ground putting the rig together. So you can see quite an expensive challenge and really attention to safety is really important in, in that process. So now I'm gonna give you very briefly, very brief overview, just to give you an idea of how the exploration went in Canada, brief case studies of four discoveries. The Lac de Gras, Akati, discovery, which really started it all, and three discoveries that I was involved with, the Buffalo Head Hills in Alberta, Renard in Quebec, and Chidliac in Nunavut. First, Lac de Gras. The trail to Lac de Gras started 10 years before the first 
kimberlite discovery. In 1981, geologist Chuck Fipke and Stu Blesson found high interest abraded indicator minerals in the Western Northwest Territories. And they began their quest toward, to find the source of those minerals. At the beginning of their work, they were supported by Superior Oil in the USA, which the exploration was managed by Hugo Dummett, a famous South African, and by Falkenbridge, who had done a lot of diamond exploration in Botswana. Between 1981 and 1989, Fipke and Blesson followed the trail 650 kilometers east to the Lac de Gras region. The first claims were staked in 1989. In 1990, a JV was formed between BHP, Diamet, Fipke, and Blesson. And in 1991, the first kimberlite and diamonds were announced and that ignited Canadian diamond fever. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And by 1998, the first mine opened and it was supported by the Dene, Tlicho, Metis and Inuit communities. Very important part of the process. The three people that were really key to making this first discovery and really kicking off the Canadian diamond business were the geologist Chuck Fipke and Stu Blesson and Hugo Dummett, a South African geologist slash mining executive. Uh, Mr. Dummett was involved at the very beginning, supported the first couple of years of work. So he was familiar with the story when in 1990, Blesson and Fipke knocked on his door and, and he immediately recognized the potential and sold it to management at BHP. Dummett was probably about the only person at BHP at the time that had diamond experience. There's very little published on the technical work that led to the initial Lac de Gras discovery. The best reference is a book Barren Lands by Kevin Krajic. And there is a lot of technical information on the region available now through government data sets, company disclosure, and lots of papers and dissertations. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the diamond fever. The first article describing the Lac de Gras discovery was on page, a three paragraph article on page 13 of the Northern Miner on November 11th, 1991. They talked about a 59 kilogram sample yielding 81 small diamonds. There were a couple more articles in 1991, but it really didn't get a lot of attention. People were trying, still trying to figure out what it all meant and everything. But in the background, claim stakers were busy staking claims in the Arctic night and junior companies, stakers, prospectors were all busy wheeling and dealing claim blocks in thinking about future exploration programs. The first claim block by the BHP Diamet Plus than 50 joint venture was 405,000 hectares in size. By the end of 1992, five times that amount of ground had been staked centered on the initial discovery claim block. 1993 and 1994, the staking continued mostly moving north. By 1995, almost the whole slave craton had been staked and there were exploration camps everywhere. By 1998, people started dropping ground. Well, hundreds of kimberlites had been discovered and the four districts that would ultimately host the five diamond mines were discovered. Jericho and Nunavut and Akati and Diavik in the Lac de Gras district and Snap Lake and Gaucho Quay. So really remarkable success exploration success over a short period of time under difficult conditions. Snow on the ground six months a year. At that time, as some of us know, there was very little published on diamond exploration, kimberlites and diamond exploration techniques. In August, 1992, Robert Bishop, a gold stock analyst, published this guide for investors, diamonds in North, North America, Point Lake and beyond. It was really a remarkable piece of work considering Mr. Bishop was a gold stock analyst and had a liberal arts degree. 
and because of the lack of publicly available information at that time. By mid-1992, barely six months after the first discovery, there were 25, 35 publicly traded exploration companies with exposure to the NWT diamond play. As I mentioned, there was very little published about diamond exploration at that time, but there were so many companies mounting exploration programs, you know, so many geologists that wanted to learn about diamond exploration. Very few people in Canada at that time knew anything. And a real seminal event in the diamond play was a 1993 short course run by the Prospectors and Development Association of Canada and Pat Sheehan, who Tanya gave a tribute to earlier. It was really a remarkable session. Again, you got to remember at this time, there was almost nothing published on diamond exploration techniques. And you can see the both the speakers and the topics in this session. You had people like Herb Helmstedt, who's giving a talk later on technotonics, Howard Cooper Smith, John Gurney and Rory Moore, Bram Yance, Nick Sobolov, really a who's who of diamond exploration. And you know, the it was really a crazy environment, almost a wild west environment. The session was oversubscribed, standing room only. Uh, all the speakers went over time. There were lots of questions, some of them that were just out of left field. And uh, session went on late into the night, and then they wheeled in a few kegs of beer, and everybody stood around the kegs of beer and tried to figure out what, what it all meant. As Exploration in the Slave Craton matured. Geologists were prognosticating about where the next discovery might be made because Canada had lots of Archean terrain that was relatively unexplored at the time. So in Alberta, there were two big staking rushes, 1992 and 1997, after Ashton discovered Kimberlites in the Buffalo Head Hills. Ashton announced their discovery in January 97, and by the summer, half of the province of Alberta was staked. Quebec, massive staking rush after the discovery of Renard in 2001. In the late 90s, exploration activity kind of moved east to the Eastern Arctic. And there were massive, massive uh, helicopter supported reconnaissance programs. And they resulted in a lot of discoveries, including Chidliac, which is one of the case studies I'll present to you in a minute. Buffalo Head Hills in Alberta. That's one of the districts that was discovered without the collection of a single indicator mineral sample. In 1995, an oil company geologist was looking at some proprietary oil company magnetics that they had used to interpret oil structures. And he saw a few high frequency near surface magnetic anomalies and he became convinced that these were kimberlites. He then looked at the company's seismic data and saw that several of these magnetic anomalies corresponded directly with seismic disruptions. So his company, the oil company, staked the claims. Then in 1996, they went looking for a partner with diamond expertise and a joint venture was formed between Ashton, Alberta Energy, and Pure Gold. In 1997, Ashton flew the first airborne magnetics, made the first discovery plus about 15 others also discovered diamonds and by 2003, 38 kimberlites were discovered. And very important aspect of the programs was great support from the Red Earth, Lubicon and Loon River Cree nations. Now I'm just gonna zoom into this little area of the Buffalo Head Hills kimberlite province on this map. The province is more or less circled by this red circle and it's located about 400 kilometers north. You can see on the left, that was the published magnetics available at the time, 2.5 kilometer line spacing. And I put the locations of four kimberlites on the map and you can see they don't show up at all. But look at the high resolution magnetics that was flown by Ashton and the kimberlites stick out like sore thumbs. Quite a dramatic, contrast. In this area, you have hundreds of meters of shale overlying the Precambrian basement. So there is a fantastic contrast to see the Kimberlites. 
It turned out a few of the kimberlites were actually outcrops, but they were hidden in the bush and probably had never been seen by a geologist before. Five of the kimberlites showed economic potential. This table summarizes some of the mini bulk and bulk sampling that was conducted. The largest sample was collected from the K-14 kimberlite, 479 tons by reverse circulation drilling and it yielded a grade of 11.7 carats per 100 tons. The best grade came from K-252, where a 22.8 ton sample yielded a grade of 55 carats per 100 tons. But the problem with K-252, one hectare and under 70 meters of till. If that kimberlite would have been at the surface like some of the other larger kimberlites, it would, it would have and been larger, it certainly would have re required detailed evaluation. Here you have a 0.76 carat yellow diamond that was found in K6. And on the right, an image showing a seismic disruption caused by the K7 kimberlite, pretty dramatic. Now, Renard. In 1996, Ashton and Soquim formed a 50-50 joint venture to explore a large region in Northern Quebec. Soquim was a Quebec Crown Exploration Company. The joint venture covered an area of about 450,000 square kilometers. And the joint venture collected about 1,500 samples over an area of about 450,000 square kilometers. And that's a density of one sample per 300 square kilometers. Most of the samples were collected from a well-developed esker system in the area. And eskers are mound, sinuous mounds of sand and gravel that were deposited by rivers that flowed underneath glacial ice. So the two-year orientation survey yielded about 20 indicator mineral anomalies. And in 1999 and 2000, follow-up programs were conducted related to each of those indicator mineral anomalies. In one area screamed kimberlite and diamonds, and that was the Foxtrot area. Believe it or not, first sample that led to the discovery of Renard was a sample that only had a couple ilmenite, and it was 20 kilometers away from the mine. In 2000, first claim block, 45,000 hectares was acquired and an airborne geophysical survey was conducted. The first kimberlite and diamonds were discovered in 2001. Between 2002 and 2012, exploration, bulk sampling and resource definition. And in 2016, the Renard mine opened. The project received great support from the Mysticine Cree Nation. This is a picture of a typical esker, sinuous mound of sand and gravel. And this is typical esker material. This map shows the magnetic signatures of the kimberlites in the core area of the Renard project and some of the first mini bulk sampling that was done to determine that there was economic potential. The best grade at the early stages came from Renard 3, a small kimberlite that had a grade of 134 carats per 100 tons. The largest kimberlite was Renard 65, 1.5 hectares, and it had a grade of 54 carats per 100 tons. These kimberlites are about the same age as the Brazil kimberlites that Paulo talked about, about 600 million years old. By 2004, there were nine kimberlites and 55 tons tested from five bodies. A real interesting event in the project was in 2003, a four carat diamond was preserved in HQ drill core. As far as I know, that's one of, if not the largest, diamond ever preserved in a sample of exploration drill core of kimberlite. Finally, I'll summarize Chidliak in Nunavut. This is an illustration really of how important partnerships were in the Canadian 
the Canadian Diamond Rush. Okay, in 2005, an alliance was formed between BHP and Peregrine. It was kind of a traditional back end deal that BHTP was so famous for at the time. It was the first stage of work would be jointly funded by the two parties, and then BHP would step back and let the junior company run with it at their own cost. And if they found anything, BHP could earn up to 51% or they could earn 51% in the project by, by funding a multiple of the exploration expenditures incurred by the junior company. So in 2005, there was an orientation survey over a large area of South Baffin Island. A, basically a grid of till samples collected at 15 kilometer centers. 2006, 2007, land acquisition and follow-up sampling. 2008, the first airborne geophysics and first kimberlite and diamond discovery. And then between 2008 and 2013, 74 kimberlite discoveries and a lot of testing and evaluation, microdiamond work and all that stuff. And between 2008 and 2011, just to emphasize the importance of alliances, BHP spent 34 million Canadian first to earn their 50% interest under the back end deal. And then after they earned in their share of exploration expenditures. In 2016, resources were defined in two pipes. And in 2018, the project was the project and the company, Peregrine, was purchased by De Beers. And like the other projects in Canada, uh, great support from the Indigenous people, the Inuit in Pengnertung and Iqaluit. This map just shows the original sampling done on a 15 kilometer grid of till samples. In the Chidliak area, five samples contained indicator minerals, one with 21 indicator minerals. This work was jointly funded by BHP and Peregrine. Peregrine then felt that this warranted further work. Peregrine, Peregrine took the data and ran with it in 2006, 2007, did a lot more sampling. It's an example in 2007, Peregrine collected 870 samples with about a third of those having indicator minerals. And the indicator minerals were clustered in three distinct areas. And that prompted Peregrine to acquire the exploration permits, which are outlined in blue on this map. One of the things that really clued us in at an early stage that we were onto something and that there was a source nearby was the surface features of the indicator minerals. They were remarkably fresh, as you can see in this photograph. Compare those minerals to some minerals from another Peregrine project that obviously exhibited a lot of a lot of transport. So this was the first airborne survey, heli-borne MAG and EM flown at 100 meter line spacing. Four days into the survey, a, a motivated field crew went out and investigated this magnetic high anomaly and found an outcrop of kimberlite, the CH1 kimberlite. A few days later, they investigated this magnetic high anomaly and found the CH2 kimberlite in outcrop. And one of the things to emphasize, not a lot of the kimberlites in Canada crop out, you know, especially in the Lac de Gras region. So this was fairly unusual and, you know, quite a bit unexpected to see kimberlites cropping out like that. And after a lot of work in 2016, Peregrine declared a resource at 22 million carats and two pipes. And the CH6 pipe was the richest. And in 2014, valuation of a 1,013 carat parcel yielded modeled diamond values between US 162 and 236 a carat. That prompted De Beers in 2018 to purchase Peregrine diamonds principally for the Chidliak project. And De Beers is currently conducting engineering studies to determine whether or not to move towards developing the project. And I think there's a good chance they will. Like Paolo mentioned, they are experimenting and studying a number of 
vertical mining methods to optimize mining of some of the smaller pipes. One of the things that can't be emphasized enough is the part that the investor played in all the great Canadian discoveries. I mean, billions of dollars invested, and a lot of that from retail, quote, mon pop investors. And a lot of money was made, a lot of money was lost, but it was a very exciting time in the markets in North America. And this chart just illustrates the story of one extremely successful company, Diamet Minerals, okay? This is their stock chart with value per share on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. They made the discovery in 1991. You can see leading up to the discovery, their stock traded for pennies. They made the discovery and the stock price just kept rising for years through the development stage, the opening of the mine. And finally in 2001, BHP bought the company for 687 million Canadian. Okay, they only own 29% of the Akati mine. And that gave the Akati mine at that time an implied project value of 2.37 billion Canadian. And another thing to emphasize is through this period, Diamet did some placements and raised money, and they did a lot of exploration in Canada and throughout the world. So they made this great discovery, but it also allowed them to do more exploration. So now I'm just going to summarize the Canadian diamond business. Between 1998 and 2020, there have been close to 264 million carats of diamonds produced from seven Canadian mines. And the value of that production is roughly 31 billion US or 39.6 billion Canadian. Okay. One of the things that's interesting, there's been quite a big fluctuation in the value of the diamonds produced from the Canadian mines. You can see that on this chart with value on the y-axis, year on the x-axis. The peak of Canadian diamond value was $236 a carat in 2011. A lot of that was, that was a big high in the diamond market and diamond prices, but it also related to the mix of production. There were some pipes with very high value diamonds being mined at that time. And the value in 2020, the average value was US 71 a carat. You can see by this pie chart in 2011, with that high value, Canada produced 18% of the world's diamonds by value ahead of South Africa, ranking third in the world. Okay. 2020 was a year affected by the pandemic, but the patterns more or less hold in 2020. Canada produced was or was ranked fourth tied with South Africa for the value of its diamond production 0.93 billion or 10 percent and they tied for number three in the volume of production with the Congo 12 percent in about 13.1 million carats. For reference in 2020 South Africa produced about 8.5 million carats of diamond. A real important thing and a very spectacular thing that's come out of the Canadian business is all the benefits for the communities and indigenous communities in, in Canada. Without the diamond business, uh, the capital of the Northwest Territories, Yellowknife, and a, a lot of the communities would be a dramatically different place. It's really, it's really uh, contributed a lot to the development of the, the regions. In 2016, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut Chamber of Mines published a paper summarizing the benefits that had been produced by the Canadian diamond business in the previous 20 years. As an example, in 2016, 3761 person years of employment with 21% of that being indigenous. 1.4 billion in business spending, 23% of that indigenous and 11 million in community benefits just in one year with 390,000 of that being scholarships. One of the accomplishments I think of the diamond business is the 
education level in a lot of the smaller communities near the mines where a significant percentage of people have worked at the mines has gone way up. A lot more people are graduating from high school and a lot more people are going to university. And just to summarize, between 1996 and 2016, 26,441 person years of employment, 18.7 billion in business spending, with 30% of that being with indigenous businesses, many of which were created just to service the mines and exploration programs. Another thing the Canadian diamond business has done for Canada, but really for the world is built a heck of a lot of capacity for, for diamond work and mining and exploration work in general. Hundreds or thousands of geologists, techs and technicians, engineers, pilots, etc., were trained through this Canadian diamond rush. And many of the people were from indigenous communities. Also, th at least three specialized laboratories devoted to diamonds really evolved and improved their techniques and purchased lots of equipment because of all the work from the Canadian diamond business. And millions and millions of dollars spent on research related to diamonds, diamond mining, and kimberlite. You know, the Geological Survey of Canada and Provincial Surveys receive grants every year to publish papers and research projects to support the diamond exploration and mining sector. And as an example of one university, the University of Alberta, since 2014, 28 MSc and PhDs completed related to subjects uh, focused on diamonds and kimberlites. Quite a bit of quite a bit of knowledge gained. And when you talk about the Canadian diamond business, you really have to give a shout out to BHP Billiton. In 1990, they came out of nowhere with no interest whatsoever in diamonds to eventually produce five to 10% of the world's diamonds for 14 years. They entered the business in 1990 through the Lac de Grade JV, and they went out and hired the best expertise available and to their exploration and mining program applied their long established mining experience and management structure to their work. And it's really remarkable. The first discovery in 1991, mine built by 1998, record time. I, I don't think I was the only one that, that first saw these discoveries and thought, oh, there's no way they're going to build a mine in that environment. My goodness, you know, snow on the ground six months of the year, 20 below half the year, most of the Kimberlites covered by lakes, 300 kilometers from tidewater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the engineers jumped in, drained the lakes, used ice roads to supply, to supply the mine site and without hardly breaking a sweat. In 12 years, two mines developed, two world-class mines developed in the Lac de Gras region, quite an engineering feat. Another thing BHP did was a lot of aggressive diamond exploration in Canada and throughout the world. Their work led to many discoveries in Canada. Then in 2011, they decided they wanted to get out of the diamond business. In 2011, they sold their Chidliac project to Peregrine for 9 million. In 2012, after 14 years of big profits, they sold the Akati mine to Dominion Diamonds for US 553 million and exited the business with no reclamation obligations. Um, they were gone, left almost without a trace. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the potential future of the Canadian diamond business. Without any new mines, mine expansions, or significant new discoveries by exploration, the business could cease by 2030. What are the ways that we can get keep the business going? Well, there's four operating mines and at each one of those, there's a potential to extend the lives. There's six undeveloped Canadian diamond resources. And I don't think the exploration potential of the vast country has been fully tapped. So first summarize the operating mines. 
four operating mines, Akadi and Diavik in the Northwest Territories, Gaucho Quay in the Northwest Territories, and Renard in Quebec. The three closed mines are Victor in Ontario, Snap Lake in the NWT, and Jericho in Nunavut. First, Akadi, the first mine that opened. Between 1998 and 2021, Akadi has produced 86.3 million carats of diamonds, and they have 28.4 million carats of reserves. So far, they've mined nine pipes, and in 2023, they're going to start their 10th open pit on Point Lake, which ironically was the first discovery in 1991. Right now, the mine is scheduled to close in 2029, but they are doing some pretty interesting exploration on the site. And they are also studying a new concept of mining, underwater remote mining, where they would float mining equipment on the water at the bottom of, of, um, of spent open pits and mine, mine out material that was really not economic to mine in an open pit. So that's a really interesting experiment and kind of fits with the vertical mining solution that a lot of people are looking at. Diavik, four pipes mined between 2003 and 2021, 142.4 million carats mined through December 2021. And right now they list 11.9 million carats of reserves. The mine is scheduled to close in 2025, but they are doing some brownfields exploration that if they're lucky, will extend the life a year or two. Renard opened in 2016. Between 2016 and 2021, about 7.5 million carats of diamond produced. They listed an initial reserve of 22.3 million carats when the mine opened. Renard has struggled to meet the goals that it set in its feasibility, but things are improving. Q122 was their best quarter ever. 409,000 carats produced at a value average value of US $143 a carat. You can see over here on this table, their previous high before that was less than $100 a carat. And finally, Gaucho Quay, a 51%, 49% De Beers Mountain Province joint venture. So far, they have mined 34.5 million carats through Q1 2022, and they list 42.6 million carats of reserves. Right now, the estimated closure is 2030, and Q1 2022 was their best diamond value to date, US 132 a carat. And prior to that, Gaucho Quay, like Renard, did struggle to meet the value projections in the Mountain Province feasibility study with the values being well less than $100 a carat. There is some blue sky at Gaucho Quay. They are working at the mine site to try to prove up more resources and Mountain Province, the 49% partner in the mine is doing some pretty aggressive exploration to the north. And they have some resources that ultimately could come into play here at the mine, maybe be mill feed in the future or be developed on its own. So there are six declared off mine site resources in Canada at this time, some of which could be developed. First, Chidliac, which I told you about, 22 million carats and two pipes. Fort Alicorn in Saskatchewan, a joint venture between Rio Tinto and Star Diamond, 66 million carats and two pipes. Rio Tinto spent over 140 million since 2017 evaluating pipes in this district. Now yet in Nunavut, a joint venture between North Arrow and Burgundy, 26 million carats and one pipe. And this project is known for a significant component of fancy yellow orange diamonds. And they're hoping that that can dramatically increase the rock value. 
Kennedy North, which I told you a little bit about. This is Mountain Province, 10 kilometers north of the Gaucho Quay mine, 21 million carat in two pipes and pretty aggressive exploration. Another pipe, DO27, which is located 30 kilometers from Diavik, 18 million carats in one pipe. DO27 has a really interesting history. It was discovered in 1993 prior to the Diavik discoveries, and it, it was a joint venture between Rio Tinto's subsidiary, Kennecott, and a few joint, a few junior companies at the time. And it showed quite a bit of economic potential. And Rio Tinto skipped kind of the mini bulk sampling stage and went right from microdiamonds to the collection of an underground bulk sample. And it created an unbelievable amount of, of excitement and expectation in the market. So in 1994, when they result, announced results that dramatically uh, did not meet expectations, the market for diamond exploration companies just melted down stocks, all of them just dropped like a rock and it, it affected people's ability to explore for a few years. And finally, there's a dike Kahuna in Southern Nunavut that has 4 million carats of pretty decent diamonds in one dike. So exploration, I think there is still potential to make another discovery that could matter in Canada, but there are some challenges. Exploration expenditures and activity are way down. You know, the sector no longer has the undivided attention of investors. 10 or 15 years ago, there were probably a, a hundred junior companies with Canadian diamond exploration interests and a lot of the stocks were trading and there was a lot of exploration activity all disclosed to the public. Today, there's probably less than 10 companies with diamond exploration interests in Canada. There've been no recent large discoveries and we know that most value and excitement is created with a new discovery. The last discovery of a Canadian resource was Chidliac in 2008. Most of the current work by the Canadian companies is on established projects. There's not a lot of grassroots exploration. And you know, some people say maybe the easy ones have been found and there's a perception by some that Canada has been fully explored, which I don't, I don't ascribe to that. So what are some of the opportunities right now? As Paul minutes. mentioned, Okay, thank you. Diamond prices are up, supply is down. The world needs new discoveries. A great discovery will stimulate more exploration. You know, the active, the active explorers in Canada, De Beers in Rio Tinto, Arctic Star, North Arrow, RJK Trezor, and Mountain Province and my company, Craton, are all trying to make new discoveries. And new ideas and technology could help to find the next big one, new geophysical technology, new ideas on glacial systems and sampling methods, advances in indicator mineral interpretation. And another question, why aren't there any Canadian lamprites? There's a bunch of them in the United States. That doesn't seem to make sense to me. Maybe there's a few there, maybe a few with uh, diamonds. Maybe they're just hard to find because they're under glacial cover and they don't have traditional indicator mineral signatures. And there's been a lot of work on basement terrains and diamond ages that are changing a few people's thinking about where you should explore. Maybe it's not just stable Archean cratons, maybe some places, Proterozoic places with good keels warrant exploration. And a real development in the research was finding that diamonds at Victor mine in Ontario were 700 million years old. So that makes you think about a few things when you're targeting areas. So to conclude, Canadian diamond business, spectacular story of discovery, growth, and benefits. No one in the 80s thought that anything like this was a possibility. And before you know it, Canada was the third leading diamond producer in the world ahead of South Africa. A huge capacity for diamond exploration and mining has been developed and we need to use that capacity to find something that'll extend 
the life of the Canadian business to another generation or two? Could something similar happen again, a great discovery like this in a new business happen again in Canada or anywhere else? I think it is possible. Came out of nowhere in Canada. So before I finish, I just wanna make a shameless promotion for the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada annual diamond session. It's virtual this year on June 28th, 1115 EST. If you haven't had enough of presentations from this short course, think about joining us. It's a real interesting topic, diamond price estimation. And I'm gonna give a short intro. I'm a co-chair, but talks by three experts in the in the diamond S, diamond valuation area, Malcolm Thurston, John Armstrong, and Andy Davey. And if you're a student or a senior, your registration is deeply discounted. So I've been in diamond exploration for a long time in North America, and it's been a real uh, exciting time to be doing it in North America. It's been really, it's been met a lot of great people, and I'm still out there trying to make a new discovery that might make a difference for the North American diamond business. So with that, I'll close and if there's time, entertain a question or two. Thank you well, very much. Thank you very much, Brooke. That was most interesting. Yes, and we do have a couple of moments left for, for some questions. Um, anybody have a question for Brooke? Yeah, Brooke is normal. I'll get the, the session going. Just um, in two minutes, we want your take. Um, you know, one of the big differences of Can in, in Canada, obviously, was you talk about the staking rush and the fact that you could get on the ground so quickly. Um, you know, just give us a, a quick synopsis. If you if you were going out today to pick up a piece of ground, you know, in, in Canada to look for diamonds, um, tell us how you do it. Well, it's, it's, it's in Northern Canada, it's really easy. Most of the permits are available online. You can just decide what you wanna acquire and it's relatively cheap to acquire the permit, but then your commitment to do work accelerate quite rapidly. So you gotta spend a lot of money. So for most of Canada, especially the remote regions, the Northern regions, it's easy, just go online, to find an area that's not already taken and click on it and have your credit card ready. But as you move south, so all of Northern Canada, it's virtually all crown minerals. But as you get to the south towards the US, there's a lot of agricultural land. The farther south you move, the less percentage of crown minerals there are. So there's also quite a bit of private mineral rights to the south. So in the south, it's not quite as easy. And one of the things I'll say is, is there are still a lot of places in Northern Canada where you can, you can acquire permits and explore for diamonds and that are prospective, but there's a lot less appetite today than there was during the frenzy of the initial Canadian diamond arrest to spend the kind of money that's required to explore these remote regions. Because they've all... They've all been explored to some degree, still a lot of work you can do, but it's so expensive. So that's been a bit of a deterrent to a lot of the Northern exploration in Canada. Lately. Yeah. No, thanks. That's great. That's very you know, useful and explanatory, particularly for us South Africans, you know, who, who don't really understand a, how easy it is to you know, pick up ground, as you say, particularly in the North. The flip side, of course, being you know, the difficulty operating at minus 20 and I think in some places minus 40 and having you know to take on all your supplies on an ice road during winter anyway thanks for that all right you're going to we do the chat box yeah right? we have two a couple of questions on chat box uh, from Sean Johnston first um have any companies applied remote sensing to detect outcrop regions and then what is the impact of permafrost on, on mining abilities, such as methane production restrict, restricting explosives? Okay, two good questions. And the first is yes, hyperspectral remote sensing has been used by 
people like De Beers and others in, in areas where there's significant outcrop. A lot of Canada, you know, there's 10, 20, 30 meters of glacial cover and it's not quite as effective, but there have been some studies that have shown a really good, really good hyperspectral anomalies associated with outcropping or subcropping kimberlites. The second is permafrost. Permafrost is, is a really big factor. A lot of the places I've worked, the permafrost goes down 300 meters, okay? That can be a positive because you don't have an issue with water coming in and everything, but you have to, you have to make sure your hole stays open and the water you use in your drill process does not freeze. So there's a mixture of salt you use to keep the holes open. Then going into mining, it's kind of a benefit because the walls hold up. In fact, I believe at a couple of the mines, they actually put in a freeze curtain to maintain the permafrost so that it doesn't melt and create a mess when you open up the pit. So I don't, I don't think it has an effect on explosives. I think it's I think it's just, it's pretty darn hard rock. And I don't know that it has, a, has an effect on explosives. So. But it is, it is a major factor. You know, a lot of the areas I've worked, the top meter or two is not permafrost, but then down to hundreds of meters, it's permafrost, ice, frozen rock.